Many game studios are having a moment right now where they need to scale and learn to be better, more professional companies. IO Interactive has this figured out with leaders like Hector. I want to give credit to IO in particular because it's not definitely in Scandinavia, work life balance is very important. So, culturally, uh, the, the relationship that people have with work, it may be a bit different than in some other places. So, here, taking care of yourself is important. That sustainability already is part of the culture. But I think IO in particular has gone through a journey. That's Hector Padilla, a people manager at IO Interactive. They're the game studio that makes the Hitman series and soon a new 007 game. Hector focuses on making teams work together while developing all these great games. We talk here about the inside view of IO Interactive, how to run a studio like a mature company, how to connect teams and people, and a little bit about the future of gaming, which you know I love to talk about. Let's go. This is Behind the Games from NewOverlords.com where we seek creators of all kinds to find out what's behind our favorite games. With your hosts, Jeff and Seema. From the Midwest studio, I'm Jeff Illamek. And from our Northeast studio, I'm Seema. Hector, welcome to the Behind the Games podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Seema. Happy to be here. We're so glad you're here. We were interested in reaching out to you in particular and IO Interactive because of your role. And we'll talk about that in detail coming up in, in just a bit. But IO Interactive being a bigger studio and mm -hmm. needing leadership and team leads, that's, mm -hmm. I think, where it, you come into play. And that's going to be fun to dig into. But before we get started on that, just so everybody has a little bit of an idea of the background and what we're talking about here, and I think they'll pick it up really quick. Why don't you introduce IO Interactive and the couple of the games? And the, I think that will remind everyone where we're at. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Um, IO Interactive is a Danish. Uh, game company has been around over 20 years. It was founded on 98, actually. And um, something that may or may not come as a surprise, it was a surprise to me, actually, when I was applying to work at IO. It's not as big as you may think. It's only a couple hundred people. So the, the level of production and the kind of quality of the games we do, I was actually thinking it may be a bigger, bigger studio. But it's just great people who really know what they are doing together, like super senior, etc. And we have studios in Copenhagen, in Malmo, Sweden, and Barcelona. And we're better known for the Hitman series. So right. I think was most pop companies, uh, most people that would know us is because of the Hitman game. And Hitman is a really interesting, fun series. We were talking a little bit about it in the lead up to this. And for people that haven't played it, it is, it's, it's a top tier game. It's got, you know, it's very cinematic. It's got a lot of story. It's got a lot of voice acting. At its mm -hmm. core, in addition to there being, you know, some fighting and combat, uh, I think we were starting to agree. It's kind of very puzzle based. It's something you can really think Super. about and be cerebral about, even though it's you're sort of telling a story through your the hits that you're going off and, and executing mm -hmm. and, and the, the story that's evolving. Uh, yeah. And I think that cerebral part of it, that puzzle part of it is is really interesting and says a lot about the, the studio itself that they, they can tell the story, they can put together a compelling narrative on top of the interesting gameplay and multiple paths through. Um, yeah, I've been a fan of the series, I don't know, more than 15 years. Like, I love it. For me, working here was almost like meeting your heroes kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> really happy to be here. And for me, I'm quite clumsy with action games. So I'm not an action game kind of the, uh, person. I love puzzles and things like that. And Hitman is great because I can approach it that way. For me, it's more about understanding the levels, the challenges, etc. And as a player, I can do all these challenges around doing the missions, being undetected. So I don't have to engage in an action-oriented way. And it's cool that the game allows different paths. And I don't know how many possible ways to finish each level exist. The completionists have all these different achievements and all these things to do. And I think it, it plays to amazing level designers that we have in the company, amazing game designers. Something to not bury the lead, although we won't talk about it in too much detail because it's still being worked on. There's a new series, a new title, a new uh, brand that's been ad adopted or, or, or starting to be worked on by IO Interactive, which is 007. I think the idea of 007 and James Bond and Secret Agent fits super well with the idea of how the Hitman series has evolved and is a great place to land that kind of 
narrative and puzzle and cerebral play while still being an adventure and, and danger and, and action. Uh, so that's got to be really exciting and, and a really great decision on both parts, on both parties to, to bring that uh, IP to IO Interactive. So that was. That I mean, was hearing cool. you talk about Hitman, Hector, has really made me want to play it. And okay. it's also made me realize that when I hear about a game, I, I think I have this filter that I just assume it's a shooter unless I hear otherwise. Yeah, and, and I, you especially can win with the, the game without shooting a bullet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to be more, have my eyes more open. <laughs> you still have to kill people. <laughs> yes. But it's well, in very creative ways. Like, yeah. Completely I, I've, I've killed many random. virtual people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. You, yeah. 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 You have me, in fact. <laughs> right. More than once. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's this cool thing that there are these bad guys that you have to take uh, down for different reasons, but you can basically get creative around. Um, Placing something that will create some sort of accident when the target walks by the steps. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to be around when that happens. You are suddenly quite far away and suddenly you have the notification that this is going on. And a camera will show you the action, but you just put some oil in the stairs and they slide down. Who knows? Like very, it's really super crazy. I, don't, I really don't even know how many possible ways are to finish the levels. It's really cool. Nice. And regarding 007. We're very, very happy with the franchise. I think we feel honored uh, that we, we were trusted with that brand. It's a, right. it's a big responsibility, but we also think that we are a great home for it. I think this studio can, can do great for that. And so far, what we have been putting together, we're very proud of it. So yeah, it's looking good. As a player, when I see those demos, I still get excited as a player. I'm like, oh, I want to play that. I want to like, that's right. cool. I love right. feeling that way about the place I work. So have you had beers with uh, Daniel Craig yet? Is that it? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see where that goes. Uh, so you said IO Interactive isn't that big a studio. 200, 300, that's still relatively big. Uh, it's, not, yeah. it's not the biggest. There's only a, you know, there's only a, a handful across the industry that are, that are bigger. Mm -hmm. How did you end up at IO Interactive? And then we'll get into your role there and why that's so important, especially when you get to the two, 300 person range. Yeah. So that's a good clarification point that you're putting, Jeff. I mean, big is relative, right? Like when you talk about yeah. Ubisoft and they have thousands of people all around the world, et cetera. So how big is too big? That's a good point. But 200 people. Plus, it's already a pretty good size, and we are growing. We want to grow. By the way, we're also working on a third title that I wish I could tell you more about, but I'm like super excited about it. Hopefully, we will announce it soon. Um, everything is up in the air regarding announcements at this point, but we're growing very quickly. Like we want to hire more people. We we have these three different locations, and um, yeah, so we're we're learning to grow and work across different different locations. And if you go to the website and just look at the pictures of the locations, why wouldn't you want to work there? Yeah, it's beautiful. Right. And we're so yeah. really happy here. Yeah. And what took me here, that's, um, I feel quite honored and very lucky that most of my background is in casual games. And I love casual games. I worked on free to play games. I worked on casual games for the Nintendo Wii, also for mobile and PC, et cetera, time management games, et cetera. Awesome. Um, that was my, area of comfort and I was very happy with a career there. I never really expected to work on a AAA studio. For me, that was for me to enjoy as a player, but not as a developer. So I was very lucky that IO actually reached out to me based on my experience, which has been managing people and helping people work better together across different locations, across different cultures, and also across disciplines getting artists and designers and programmers, everyone coming together, learn to speak the same language. Also people in Spain, people in Netherlands, people in Denmark, Vietnam, etc. So it seems that my experience building teams was very attractive to IO. Also my technical background helped. Uh, and they reached out to me and I was very happy to engage during the interview process, which was delightful. And I jumped into the opportunity. So I was actually approached by them. That's Amazing. And that speaks really high, highly to IO Interactive that two things that they recognize this need and this demand for 
good leadership and team team leadership and put and communication and somebody that can put those kind of teams together. And then that they went out and found the best people in the industry to go and do that. Regardless of location, we are looking for people, whatever they are. There's a piece of what, how IO Interactive presents themselves. If you go to the IO Interactive website and look at some of the videos that are produced, in addition to trailers for the games and, hey, get excited about 007, there's videos out there that talk about team leadership and management of, of teams and, and why this is important to them. And they're beautifully produced videos. I need to, to, to learn from them, but <laughs> you're in you. some of those I, I videos. It's, it speaks very, very highly to the kind of culture and quality of organization, quality of business, quality of company that IO Interactive is. So that was super impressive to me when I started looking into that and, and watching some of those videos. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the reasons why I chose to join, actually. I, I'll be very honest with you. I wasn't sure I wanted to work on AAA. We have all heard those uh, horror stories, right, about crazy mm-hmm. crunch, etc., and on sustainable work conditions. So I, I had kind of kept boundaries on my career around AAA because I didn't want to be a part of that. When I started learning more about IOI, I was like, oh, wow, like, this is almost too good to be true. Like, this... The way this company treats their people, when you read Glassdoor, etc., it's just really, really positive. When I joined, so my title is people manager, and my role is making sure that people within the tech organization feel that this is a place where they want to make a long career. I'm not attached to any particular project, so I'm not. Of course, I care, but my Biggest pressure are not the deadlines or budgets or anything like that. It's more like, for example, you, Sim, or Jeff, if you were employees at IO, I would be constantly having communications with you to see how are you doing? What are your stress levels like? How can I give you any kinds of tools to grow in your career? What's missing? What, what will it take for you to get a promotion or a pay increase? Why haven't you taken your vacation? Like, hey, you have all these vacation days. Please take vacation. And, um, yeah. and I love doing that. And you mentioned promotion. Is it, how do you, do you have employees or do you not want employees that are not that interested in promotion who like what they're doing and maybe want to branch out, you know, uh, laterally, but not necessarily go into management? We, and I see this trend happening a bit more across the industry, but I'm really happy that we do that at IO as well. So there are three different aspects to your what you just said. One is, in order to grow, you do not need to become a lead or a manager. That's a common mistake. Like, if you are the best artist, why am I going to make you a manager? And you're mm-hmm. going to potentially exactly. be miserable. You and your team may really be deeply unhappy with this, right? So if you love being an artist, let me let you be an artist and just be an amazing artist. So you can yeah. grow as a principal level, distinguished, etc., career-wise as, as what we're calling an individual contributor. So becoming a lead is actually just a different way to provide a service to the team. But it's not the only way to grow. There are multiple ways that you can go, and it can be very incisive technical expertise um, regarding design, art, or programming. And also there is people that I talk to and I'm like, hey, you know what? I think you would be ready for a promotion. You are doing great. We all see that. And they can be like, you know what, Hector? At this time in my life, I have the relationship with my work that I want. I don't want to be promoted. I'm like, perfect. Which is great. There's nothing for me other than respect that. And it's really, really cool. But you need to engage and have those conversations. This kind of concept is probably, it's, I would bet, and maybe I'm wrong, and this is what I hope to, to learn with through more of these interviews, but probably not all that common with the games industry. A lot of the game studios have started as, as little, you know, two, three-man shops, and some of them have really great work culture. And we, went, we talked yeah. to Total Mayhem Games in Rotterdam, and Lucia there is leading this 25-person team, but really focused on culture and protecting people and creating long-term careers. Everything of what you're talking about, though, reminds me very much of the best you know, enterprise, big business corporations that, that know how to build a sustainable culture and organization. I came from working at Microsoft and I came from working at Accenture. And in those organizations, they do recognize that 
there should be advancement in career path and growth, but within the individual contributor roles. Sorry. They do uh, e execute initiatives like, let's make sure people aren't working too much and take their mm -hmm. vacation time. We don't want people burnt out. It's exactly. these are it's great a long people. Game. It's not scalable. Yeah. The, the people are the core of an organization. The, the people are what make the games and it, keeping the, the people happy and healthy and, you know, sustainable and productive. That's a huge, a huge responsibility of an organization. So it speaks very highly to the senior leadership in IO Interactive that they've, it, I, I wonder who there like came from, you know, these, these bigger professional uh, organizations. Cause this sounds like, you know, this sounds like a 10,000 person, you know, consulting organization, best of the best kind of company. Yeah. I, I really recognize the fact that IO saw the value on this kind of role. And I want to give credit to IO in particular, because it's not definitely in Scandinavia, work-life balance is very important. So culturally, uh, the, the relationship that people have with work, it may be a bit different than in some other places. So here, taking care of yourself is important. That sustainability already is part of the culture. But I think IO in particular has gone through a journey. What I have learned by talking to people that have been on IO before, there were moments in IO's history where there was crunch. But they also learned that it's not the way. It burns people out, et cetera, et cetera. It's not sustainable. And I'm very happy that, okay, that happened, but they are growing out of it. We grew out of it. And it's, we recognize that that's not something to shoot for or to be proud of. And they have designed a different way to operate in a more sustainable way, like in the long game. Oh, that's great. People on my team have been here 20 years recently. We celebrated the 20 year anniversary of someone and it's great. That's amazing. It is amazing. People sticking around that long speaks very highly of the organization, but it also does make IO Interactive a sort of a senior organization, a, a senior well, game company amongst yeah. the community of, of peers, I yeah. would think, which is re really interesting and really fun. And that, that helps also regarding the sustainability, because a lot of the people regarding seniority, et cetera, a lot of people are parents, they have families and all that. Right. So we want to create the space where people can actually be a father, a mother. And be able to take care of children if something is going on at home. So there's some flexibility around that. And that has allowed or forced the company to just learn to work smarter, accommodate these different levels of energy and needs of people who may be in a different place in their career. I do think there's more stories like this within the gaming industry. I think the, the, the worst case examples are the ones that get the most headlines. Um, Usually. I think, and I think there's a big, been a big change in the last five years as well. Uh, I think there's more and more game companies that are becoming like this, that are taking care of their employees, that are great places to work, that are recognizing that burning people out and crunch hours and, you know, that, that kind of deadline management is bad business. It's not it's the not way a to, strategy. to exactly. and it's not going to make better games. Yeah. Uh, so that. What I hope by, you know, say a year from now, after I've talked to a, a bunch of studios and come back and talk to IO Interactive again, is to be able to put together, like, you know, a, a TED talk that says, here's, here's what I learned of, of how mature the game industry is becoming. And this, this can be one of those shining examples. Yeah. Another piece that, that you started to, to touch on there and the fact that IO Interactive is, is relatively international and you've worked lots of places is the kind of different working styles. Uh, mm -hmm. so yeah. you as a, a people manager need to navigate those different working styles and sometimes different working styles within a company, because you'll have teams in, mm -hmm. in different places and spread around the world. Why yeah. don't you describe some of, of what you've gone through there and your role in sort of marrying those styles together? Super interesting. Uh, thankfully I have been able to, I've been around this kind of situation before. So I have learned to navigate it. Right. And basically one of the aspects where this becomes very obvious culturally is something known as relation, uh, distance to authority. Mm -hmm. so for example, in Scandinavia, the distance to authority is very low, very short, meaning organizations tend to be very flat. People in leadership position play a bit more the role of coach and mentor. There is authority, there is direction, but everyone can just go talk to the CEO. And it's a very, very friendly, very close relationship. 
and it goes both ways. So in IO, the CEO or one of the other, like the chief creative officer or someone else would can come by your desk and be like, oh, what you're working on is super interesting. That, that looks very nice. On the, or they can also say like, oh, it would be cool if the character could jump a little higher or whatever you can think. But it's the CEO saying that. People in Scandinavia could be like, oh, yeah, cool, I hear you, but you are wrong. <laughs> like, this job is fine. And they can engage in a fun conversation. But when a leader from a Scandinavian country says that to someone in Spain, it could be like, oh, my God, the boss just told me that the character should jump higher. And I need to just do it. Right. Because the distance to authority, traditionally, in, a, in, in Spain, for example, is higher. You're supposed to traditionally listen to the boss. Now, these are generalizations, but they are there mm -hmm. for a reason. And you need to learn those things. So I need to talk to people and tell them, hey, you know what? You need to realize that your title carries certain weight. And what you can say as a very casual comment about someone's work, in some places, it could be taken as a very heavy direction. And people wouldn't Got engage it. in telling you you're wrong or something. And it's not, no one is right or wrong, but we need to acknowledge the differences and they can, we can create bridges between each other so that there are no misunderstandings. But we need to understand that we're different. So you're not only managing the, the people that, that you're sort of uh, the manage, managing over, but you're managing upwards as well. And oh, totally, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is critical and great and really appreciated by enlightened leadership, uh, managing yeah. upwards and getting that kind of feedback and how do I work better with this team? Because it, especially at a game company, I would imagine a lot of the senior leadership are creators themselves and they want, <laughs> they do want and to get, get their fingers in the hands. And they want to in, talk about it. And it's right. like, oh my God, that's so cool. And they, they also game designers themselves, right? This is, this is so funny to me because I, I worked for several years in the financial industry. I was in IT myself, but in the financial industry. And to us, managing up meant protecting your people from huh? the higher echelon. And we had an incredible distance to authority. Yeah. Like yeah. we had assistant vice president, vice president, first vice president, executive vice president. And we haven't even gotten to the CEO yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So many yeah. layers in between the individual yeah. contributor yeah. and the CEO. Yeah. And you never wanted any of those guys to come down on you. It was a crazy <laughs> environment. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And you need, you just need to, you learn to navigate those things. And I, I yeah, remember on a previous company talking to the art director and, and just talking to him and telling him like, Hey, you know what? The way you're coming across, you're coming across as very rough to, the, to our artists in this other country. Why don't you just talk to them and let them know that you're not, it's not coming from a bad place. You're not being mean. This is just your communication style and learn to work together. And it takes a few months to meet somewhere in between, but you yeah. cannot just leave it to chance. It has to be managed. Right. It requires someone taking that kind of action and mediating those relationships. Yeah. The, the team members themselves need to learn and grow as well. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. Even in, a, an organization or a culture or a country where it is very flat, you can still have people that are new, people that are just starting their careers that don't get it right. and don't understand and are afraid to interact and be part of the team in that way. And then they hit, they need to be coached and, and learn and yeah. go too. So that's one direction up, up and down and, and coaching in between there. Then there's coaching between the different roles technical and artist and the language between them. So we're, mm -hmm. we're, I know you do some work in that space too. Why don't you describe some of that? Yeah. I mean, that one is also f fascinating. Uh, it applies be between disciplines and it can also sometimes I have seen it less at IO, but I have seen it also happening between age difference. Um, a professional in their forties working with someone fresh out of school. And sometimes it can feel like they are not speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. Um, the typical example between an artist and a programmer, they just, and again, I'm, these are generalizations, but they are useful because there are trends and someone can be very analytical and they process the world through data and they process the world through facts and someone can be much more emotional and they process the world through storytelling 
and they can both of them be arguing all day. One is saying that it's a six in the floor. The other one is arguing that it's a nine in the floor. And they're talking about the exact same number. They are just looking at it from a different <laughs> point of view. Yeah. Right? So often we need to just take them and be like, you're actually describing the same number. You're just looking at it from a different angle. Come ahead, stand here. You're just using different language to describe the same problem. You both want the same, but you're coming across. And again, left to its own devices, it can be a funny because I'm, I'm choosing for it to be funny, but it can get quite right. sad. That's on dance of misunderstandings, right? Uh, but we, ne we need to talk it out. I mean, like, oh, okay, this is the way you process information. Like, if I want to present something to you, I need to be very factual. You, you really don't care about the, the, the storytelling aspect. But if I want to convince someone else about a project, I need to know that they are not detail oriented. They don't care about the data. I need to tell them a story that is emotional so that they mm -hmm. get fired up about it. And neither of them are wrong. They're just different right. communication styles. And we right. need to learn to work together. We, we, all, we do a lot of that. I'm the people manager only for the tech. The, we also have a people manager for design and one for art. But we work together all the time. A lot of what we do is interchangeable and it transcends discipline because people are people. And many of the issues we deal with are not about art or design or programming. It's more about how are we working better. So how, how are those teams sort of structured at IO Interactive then? Are they, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about how it even works physically. Are they, mm -hmm. is everyone working in the office right now and like grouped up in little teams and cubes and, or I would imagine probably not all in the office, office these days. So let's, let's start there and then we'll, we'll see how the teams sort of group up and interact and, and cross over. Yeah. So that's interesting. The way IO is set up right now is we are split basically on three teams so we're still working on hitman we're working on the 007 game and we are working on this unannounced style now the three teams are also sitting on three different locations which is copenhagen barcelona and malmo and we don't want to treat copenhagen as the main office or anything we want all the office to be equally important there is this idea that we believe in that Neither office should be more than 150 people or so, so that there is also this sense of familiarity, etc. So as we grow as a company, we're going through that through more locations. So we yeah. have learned to work fully distributed, which means even though I may be in the office in Copenhagen, my other mates are in Sweden and in Barcelona, and we need to work together remotely. So we have learned to do that quite well. Of course, uh, in the past couple of years, we all had to learn to work remote, work from home, etc., which was kind of a um, way to brute force test these uh, right. distributed team practices. We have gotten quite good at that. Uh, people, uh, so we're currently working at a hybrid model where you're supposed to come to the office a couple of days per week. Uh, if you want to work from home, you can also do it. Um, I'm the kind of person who loves going to the office, so I actually go there. It's easier for me to separate my work life and my personal life if I do that. But not everyone is like that. And at IO, we recognize that everyone is different. If you'd rather work from home as many days as possible, the, currently we have an agreement like, okay, we at least let's come to the office together on Fridays, which is when we have these team meetings where we keep updated how things are going. We show demos, etc. But for the most part, we want to keep this hybrid flexibility. And we work interdisciplinary. So the programmer is working closely with the game designer, okay. etc. So each project has different groups of people solving a problem together. And usually those groups can be cross-discipline. Now, to, to back it up for just a second, did, you've got the three offices. It, say the, the 007 team. Is the 007 team spread across all three offices or is yeah. it sort of concentrated in one of the office? It's spread so it's, out across, actually, the other okay. day I was, I didn't even realize, but I was like, oh, wow, like most of the gameplay people are in Sweden and a lot of the AI people are in Denmark and a lot of the engine and render people are maybe in Barcelona. And it's funny because everyone just comes together and makes it work pretty well. Yeah, okay that hybrid approach needs to apply both to the people that even if they are in the office all day 
you're still yeah. working remotely with some team members working locally with other team members and that I, experience in in working hybrid really comes into play i'm sure i mean the the word hybrid is it can be confusing right and i think right. something that a lot of companies are experimenting with different models this year yeah. i don't know where everything will land after a lot of experimentation at io we we just tell people we don't know like we're trying things out so let's see in six months, we may try something else and all that. But one thing that I, I have to believe is that hybrid is harder than either full remote or full in the office, hmm. uh, just because then you have to make both things work. And the thing that makes it easier is that even if you were in the office, we should work as much as possible as if we were all fully distributed and remote, which means Let's have the meetings over Zoom. Let's take digital documents, et cetera. Et cetera. Okay, that way yeah. you don't let, leave people out, right? Like the two colleagues that may be in Barcelona, just keep working like full remote kind of. Otherwise, it's easy to just forget about a colleague here and there. They were not part of a discussion. It can create issues and we don't want that. I mean, that was going to be part of my question is like one of the arguments you hear over and over again against any kind of remote work is what about the hallway? conversations. And hearing you talk just now also reminded me, what about connections you make that will lead to improvements in your personal standing in the company? Okay. Um, so you have to, you know, work on all those issues all the time. It seems like if you're, if you're hybrid or remote. Like you get probably the best of world, both worlds, but also the worst of both, right? And then you just have, and you have to make it work. But I, the way we're doing hybrid right now, I think works pretty well because we still have those casual relationships. People like spending time with each other. So a lot of people will choose to go to the office because they, they choose to go to the office. They, they enjoy it. And the, the other aspect is, I believe working distributed has a lot of merits on its own. That if you keep evaluating for everything you are losing by not being together, you are mm -hmm. not giving it a chance. So yeah, evaluate point. hybrid for everything that it can be, not for everything that it's not. If I am making any sense. No, you're making perfect yeah. sense. So you may lose a couple of things, but you win many others. So instead of getting caught up on all the things that you may be missing, we can get a little bit leverage on top of all the things that we are gaining. Build on top of that. That idea of defaulting to hybrid, no matter what you do, just in terms of structuring meetings and structuring the work process and structuring the, the schedule, defaulting to hybrid because some, somebody may be hybrid at some point in time. The best, the companies that have been doing this the best, like the past couple of years, have taken that approach. So yeah, I, I, and I, I think it works. Agree. Now, when you have those remote people coming in, are people turning on their cameras or are there any other, uh, any sort of uh, other sort of tricks to, to tell, you know, telepresence them in that, that you guys have come up with for IO Interactive? I mean, we have made sure that everyone has a proper setup, like proper uh, high definition cameras, etc. In the office, we actually were experimenting with camera angles and we, we realized that, okay, the cameras are too high and it makes us feel Detached, like the, the, the view is like I'm looking at people down on the table, right? So we actually are moving the cameras down to eye level. So that whoever is joining remote still feels eye level with the rest of the people that may be in the room, even things like that. Like we're playing with it. Uh, something that may play to our benefit, it may or may not be accidental, but we don't have a lot of meeting rooms in the office. Definitely mm -hmm. not a lot of large meeting rooms. We have a lot of for like, four group workshop, like four people workshops or for one-on-ones, but 20 people in a room, we don't really have a lot of those. So if we want to all get together, I have a team wide meeting, like everyone from 007, we may just do it from our desks. Like everyone joins remote. You can be yeah. in Copenhagen, in Barcelona or in Malmo. We are sitting in the desk, but we are all joining remote. We're in the same page. We record all the meetings in case oh, anyone didn't, couldn't make it or anything. They can always catch the meeting after the fact. We're tr just trying a bunch of things. Sometimes, and I don't know if this has come up for you, sometimes that's a difficult working style, especially for the creatives. 
for the people mm -hmm. that the, the artists or then people doing storyboards, they, those teams, and I've worked with, with studios and in a corporate environment as well. They like to put a bunch of things up on the wall and start, you know, drawing and doing art and get, you know, getting a bunch of people together, collaborating in a really tactile way. Mm -hmm. Does that still, does that still happen? Or do you, you know, do you sort of take moments out of the schedule and get people together in, in a room somewhere or like on, even on an offsite to, to make some of those kinds of things happen? How does that work? Or do you use digital tools to do it, which you can do today? It's, it's great that that comes up. I mean, a lot of digital artists, uh, musicians, but also graphic artists, concept artists, etc. Um, over the past years, more and more are moving fully digital. Even people drawing on their uh, Cintiq, but also on a, like an iPad or etc. So going fully digital is becoming less of a thing. Uh, some artists love sketching out things and they, they will still do pen and paper. The, and I love having concept art around me in the office. It's part yeah. of the things that I love from working on games. But I think we have learned to get good at that. And we do create spaces where if a team wants to get together, like recently on this unannounced title, we had maybe, I don't remember how many concept artists coming together uh, and doing just a bunch of awesome concepts to solve a particular problem in our world building. So they all came together and there's also a, team building aspect, have lunch together, go out. And all those relationships are still there. A couple of weeks ago, we had a similar in Barcelona with the core engine team, people getting together, discussing some things. It's great to work together, but the social aspect is super important. Um, going for lunch, having that, <laughs> so on. Barcelona is so a we, wonderful place to do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we do, I, I think we do a bit of both. We, we, we mix it up. Ah, that's excellent. I think this is amazing. This is a great place for for you as as bringing this experience to IO Interactive. You've done this before, though, as well. You've been in organizations that have gotten big, mm -hmm. um, and I, IO Interactive is in this position where they're on this journey to to get big right now. Yeah. What did what does that feel like to be at that tipping point where an organization starts to to get big, and yeah. and where do you sort of play into that? I didn't set out to, to make that happen in my career. It has sort of happened on its own, and I'm, now I'm, I lean on it, and I love it. But the companies go to a, an inception stage. Right? Like there is a group of people that come together, and they are trying things out, etc. And then suddenly something happens. There's a tipping point, and it becomes what is lately being referred to as a scale-up. The scaling can happen very quickly uh, or not, but I have been on different companies on that regard. It feels like being on a crazy rocket ship. It's a <laughs> lot of fun. It can be a bit gut wrenching too. Mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a woman that I love her writing. She's called Molly Graham. She writes a lot of really cool articles about scaling companies and like first round review and some other websites. And she talks about all the challenges of scaling companies. She has been there and scaling many companies in Silicon Valley and all that. And I love the, how she talks about it. And I totally agree. It is unstable. It's a bit crazy. It's a bit like going and exploring the unknown, but I get energized by it. There's a lot of change. It's a moment when you can no longer just wing it. You need to start building some structure some documentation, maybe not too much, but there's people who resisted and how much is too yeah. much and all these transition phases where before we were 20 people in a room, it's easy. It maybe 40 people in a room, it's easy. 70 people, it's just no longer easy. You right. need to start documenting things. You need to start talking, being more intentional about how you work together. And I love it. It's, a, it's an interesting challenge. I was there, for example, early days in Singa. When I joined, we were about 200 people. And when I left, we were over 3,000. This was yeah. in the span of just like three years. It was crazy to see how that changed. And yeah, uh, more recently in Mexico, I joined, we were 60 people. And I left three years later, we were about 600 people. And yeah, but basically every six months, you're a, you a different company. You're reinventing yourself, new processes, new ways to communicate. What used to work six months ago no longer works because now we're 200 more people, a thousand right. more people. 
Another thing I think that happens in that situation is we were talking earlier about businesses learning uh, certain lessons. But when you're mm -hmm. going like that, the person who learned that lesson moves on. They're not your boss anymore. And someone new comes mm -hmm. who hasn't learned that lesson yet. Yeah. You know, it can be crazy. And it's culture, crazy, but yeah. fun, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, it, that's what I tell people. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I love this topic. You can tell. It's just, this is a situation that can feel a bit on, on balancing because we are finding our, our ground. Like we are anchoring ourselves on something that is not there yet. We're building for the future a lot. And it can either trigger anxiety or curiosity. So I invite people to approach it from a place of curiosity. Like, I wonder what will happen. Like, I'm really excited to read this book and I want to see what's on the next page. And, uh, that's the best way to address company during scale. So much change is fun. I would hope and think, and this, I'm sure it's not universal, but the kind of people that are in the games industry would hopefully be a little bit more adventurous and a little bit more in, in, interested in challenge and, and things like that. You get some other industries where any kind of change is, is very traumatic. Very Somebody just wants to yeah. come into their desk every day, do the, do the same thing every day, and any kind of disruption, you know, the, the new cover letter on the memos is, is you're, you're, you know, you're, this, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going from 200 to 3,000 people, that's, that's crazy. That's yeah, super that's crazy. crazy. Yeah, that's, that's catastrophically disruptive to anyone's work work model and work schedule. But as you say, for the people that are curious and adventurous, there's a whole lot of opportunity then. Super in stimulating. Anyone who wants to explore leadership, mentorship, et cetera, like this is a bad, like there are some more, way more stable companies that if you want to grow your sphere of influence professionally, basically you have to wait for someone to quit. There's no room. Yeah. Right. For a company that is expanding, the, the room for growth is just there. It's organically mm -hmm. there. You can expand together with the company. And on the creative side as well, if you're a, yes. a creative and you're working on a particular project, suddenly having five other projects that are you know, on the drawing board that you could yeah. sort of cherry pick and pick and choose from and go off and do, which is something you're even more passionate about, yeah. that gets really, really exciting. 007. I, oh, what? We're going to get 007? This is something. Oh, this unannounced yeah, yeah, yeah. project? Now you, I know, oh, wow. Yeah. No, I love Hitman. I'm good. This, it creates a lot of interesting creative opportunity that's got to be really fun for the people that are up for it. And the people that are a little more conservative, it takes some effort. It takes some work. It takes some coaching yeah. from leadership exactly. to, to bring those people along. The change management is the term for, for that exactly. in the enterprise world. To, bring those people forward and make sure that they feel that they're still being supported and their, their jobs aren't going away. <laughs> their their way of life back. isn't exploding. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, games industry, uh, as you were saying, change is common, right? Like you may have gotten used to and mastered PlayStation 2. But hey, Sony just announced PlayStation 3 and it's a completely different yeah. graphics architecture. Everything you knew about how to render something is different. Like now all these processors. So you need to, you're reinventing yourself all the time, all these engines, That's all these true. graphics, new things, new ways to interact. And um, you're right that just the nature of the business, usually if you're working on games, you're naturally curious. and You probably enjoy reinventing yourself every now and then. I hadn't really thought about it, but you're right. I think it's part of, what attracts yeah. people to this industry? Tech people as well. Tech people constantly need to be increasing their skills, learning the new framework, learning the new language, Unreal 5, Unity, new versions come out, new platforms, yeah. new tools. We're building a new tool. We're building a new platform. Yeah. That happens constantly. New graphic Tech cards, are, new shading yeah. opportunities, et cetera. So that's, that's IO Interactive. Let's expand our view. I just wanted to get a little bit of your thoughts on the games industry in general of sort of where it's at today and where it's going. I'll throw a couple things at you and we can sort of see, see what, what things gel. You said one thing in particular, and this is a particular interest of mine that I may even do more work on in the future is the monetization model. You've worked on free to play. You've worked mm -hmm. on going to buy this box and yeah. buy expansions. 
What's sort of your your view on on free to play? Because it sits at a weird place right now in some people's minds and in industry people's minds. Um, sort of where do you fall on on free to play being good, bad, the worst thing ever? <laughs> <laughs> um, I definitely I don't I don't think it's the worst thing ever, and I think there are people who are definitely on that camp. Um, I think there are some game developers that look down on mobile games, for example. If they were less valuable or anything. Um, I don't, I'm not on that camp at all. I think there is a lot of value. The more the merrier, having all these different kinds of games, all these different kinds of experiences, way to engage players. Free to play is also very broad as a terminology. Yes. And um, I do believe there are some bad actors. There, there can be what I am calling predatory practices. The, when you Google or, or you research about dark patterns of UX that are basically there to exploit human dopamine triggers and behavior yep. and all that. That documentary came out recently about how social networks do this, etc. Right? And I think when you start getting into that, there is definitely some the dark side of the force. And right. <laughs> I, I cannot pretend that doesn't exist. But I also believe free to play has allowed a lot of people to play and experience amazing games. Um, obviously, the, some of the bigger titles are, for example, I don't know, League of Legends, Unreal, um, Fall Guys, right. I don't know, all these, all these games, sorry, I, Fortnite. But at the end of the day, there are a lot of indie developers who have been able to ship amazing indie titles that are free to play as well, and they monetize through ads. So it allows a lot of people to experience and play those games. And then you can choose to remove the ads by playing a dollar or two, which is yeah. it's basically a tip. You're like, you know what? I'm having such a great time with this game. I can play it forever looking at, for an ad every now and then, or I will pay to disable ads, which is a, a way for me to tell you as a developer that I'm really having a good time playing your game. And I love that that exists and a lot of indie game developers are able to make a living that way. So um, it's a tool, can be, can be used for evil, but I think it has had also a lot of positive effects in the industry. And I try to lean on that. I think there's room for tons of conversation around this and, and probably yeah, much, we, we could do we a whole other hour or two. And yeah. yeah, we could do a whole podcast series on, on this, but I think you're right. It does provide, it creates opportunity. It creates yeah. opportunity for new games to get created for new game players to be able to try more and new things, it expands the opportunity of, of what's And it gives there. you also opportunity to stay connected to people that you might have connected with in a particular game. If they go free to play or if I go free to play, we still see each other. The community, right? Yeah, you can dip yeah. back into, we play a lot of MMOs and Seam mm -hmm. and I in particular. Yeah. Any of the MMOs that are free to play, we can keep it loaded up. We can keep it installed and we can drop back in and see some of our friends there. And yeah. It's an old familiar world and, I, and you can love it, right? Yeah, and I think, right. I mean, the industry is moving to, uh, who knows what the industry will look like even in yeah. five or 10 years. Like right now, subscription models are becoming a huge thing. And that will change how even some games are designed because of the, the way the revenue is distributed across subscription services and all that. So. A lot of things are interestingly changing. The model of charging $60 for a AAA title hasn't changed like in 20 years. Like mm -hmm. AAA titles have still costed like $60 around, yeah. $59 mm -hmm. for the past 15, 20 years. But the production cost have skyrocketed. They are way more expensive than 20 years ago. So that model is also not sustainable. A lot of studios are one game away from uh, having an empty bank. Right. Because the people assume that profits are huge, but actually making a game is quite expensive. So that that fifty-nine can sometimes barely recoup cost. I think it's, so it's free to play can even help can even help those those huge AAA that. companies. Yeah. Yes. Well, free to play and then all of the other sort of monetization models, models around yeah. it. The yeah. buy, you know, ca cash out buying cosmetics or, yeah. uh, or all of these new experimental things that are going on on the side too, that probably aren't implemented very well right now, like NFTs, 
you know, that, that's, that's only been bad so far, but yes. there, there are other things that are being tried. And I completely agree that it, it has to not be sustainable. The $60 for a, the box cost, it's all, it's almost cost that to, you know, to, to go almost for just one person to go see a movie these days. And yeah. we talked to Eduardo from Ubisoft, who's the audio director out there in Ubisoft Toronto. The amount of effort is equivalent to putting together 10, 15, 20 movies, the kind oh, of yeah. hours of recording and the actors and the team members and the developers and the, 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 Writers the effort and, yeah. that goes into it, the cost that goes into it, it's huge. Yeah. So for the ticket to enter, to be that just that one cost that's never gone up over the, over, as you say, over yeah. the first last 20 years, it, the, Unless we expect that we should someday be paying two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars for a game, we as gamers need to be embracing some of these other monetization models as well. Yeah, I, I think a lot of gamers are looking at uh, obvious benefits, uh, some free to play, but also the subscription models that Xbox is um, trying yeah. out, or also PlayStation with their new models. The um, the way revenue is going to be shared that way is still being worked right. at. I think all these things are being designed and experimented on. The next five years will be very interesting. The industry seems to be going through a consolidation period. The past six months, all these acquisitions were announced. Right? So as a way to manage risks, because again, it gets very expensive to ship a title and if it doesn't sell well, you may be in trouble. So companies just bundle together to distribute risks. IO remains proudly independent. Like IO became independent from Square Enix a few years back, and, um, and we're still independent. But a lot of companies left and right are getting acquired by Sony, Xbox, Tencent, etc. Yeah, and it's um, a lot of things are happening in the industry. It's actually a very interesting place to be because I don't know right. what it will look like. It is an interesting time. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true, and that's fun. It's fun to see, and it it's fun to see from a gamer perspective too because it. Seems like it's going to generate some new things, at least new opportunities. Yeah, and new gamers ideas. have so many choices. It's, it's great, right? Yeah. It is. It's excellent. All right, let's pick. Let's pick one more, and I'll I'll give you a choice. Let's look even a little bit further out into the future. And a couple of things that really excite me are things like virtual reality and metaverse, and how is that going to change gaming in general? Uh, things like. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning models and either that generating content or becoming, you know, more, more challenging parts of puzzles and the AI that, that we encounter in games. Yeah. Um, and then there's more, more and more and more. So is there anything sort of in that, in that future tech area that's exciting you right now, or that's, that's crazy out there that you're thinking about? I'm curious. I'm very curious about a lot of these things. I, I think VR is a very interesting space. At, at IO, we, we have invested in, in VR. We, have, we won quite a few awards for the VR release of Hitman 3. It's actually pretty well done. It looks really mm -hmm. cool. The levels are beautiful and all that. The, I still wonder how mainstream it will get because I, I do believe we have some issues around the comfort of wearing the headset for an extended period of time, it makes some people dizzy, motion sickness, what is called a simulation sickness. The fact that your brain is getting all this input, but the rest of your body is just sitting down. There's this cognitive dissonance and it yeah. actually makes some people sick. So there are a lot of interesting unsolved problems before I think we can go mainstream there. But I, I love, I love where it can go. And I'm really curious about what the metaverse will be. I think it's uh, lately the label is a bit overused, but it could end up becoming a collection of open protocols. Um, the metaverse is not one thing, but it's just a bunch of in yes. interconnected interfaces through APIs. And I can be engaging on it through my smartphone, but then through my computer, another aspect, and then VR, another aspect, or a console, another thing. It's more like a bunch of interconnected game worlds. I'm very excited about that. I don't think the metaverse will be any one company. I, I, I think it may look a bit more like the internet, hopefully, and a bunch of open protocols and then things connecting with each other. But it's, it's a bit of a buzzword as well lately. But I'm very excited about the potential iterations 
of that in the next 10 years. Actually, let's see where it yeah. goes. For VR, I really want headsets to get more comfortable because I'm the kind of person right. who, <laughs> yes. with my glasses and all, it gets foggy and all that. So sadly for me, it's not a, I don't, I like it, but after 20 minutes, I'm, I cannot keep engaging. And I think it will get there more as the experience yep. becomes more pleasant and that kind of stuff. So it's a hardware thing too. Well, that matches pretty well with my thoughts on, on across those topics in particular. Your ideas around the metaverse, I think, are important and something to explore further. And everybody that's starting to think about the metaverse out there should learn from what you just said, which is the best version of thinking about the metaverse is this open interchange, this, these open APIs, open protocols to have a crossover, not only between the different platforms, which may implement their own kind of metaverse walled garden, but across experiences and, you know, the mobile to desktop to headset to the metaverse should ex extend across those as well. Uh, I did a, I, I have a business podcast called Un <laughs> Unevenly Distributed because the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Unevenly distributed. William Gibson quote. Uh, we did a whole episode on the metaverse and talked through these concepts e exactly. Mm -hmm. So that, that mirrors e exactly what I'm hoping for, what my colleague um, in enterprise oh, computing cool. is, is hoping for as well. Nice. Um, and then I'm right there with you on the, on the headset. I've got, I've got my Meta Quest 2 sitting right over there. There's higher quality versions of that. Unfortunately, the, the higher quality versions of that, which even get rid of the motion sickness a little bit more, are still giant and big and bulky. Yeah. You got like the, the new Valve ones. And if you wear glasses, it can get foggy or uncomfortable. Yeah. We're going to have to get to the point where, and this may end up being some of those mixed reality platforms where it's got to end up like Ray-Bans. And this is maybe 10 years out, 15 years out, but it's, it's got to end up like, like sunglasses that I can just put on. And the best implementations of that will probably cross over with metaverse implementations. And I can okay. either use it as a VR immersive, I'm somewhere else, or augmented reality. And I can look around my world and use those glasses to put holograms and data and information and games and interactions, social interactions around the space where I live. Yeah. Um, I mean, so 15 years ago, we didn't have smartphones. Um, and we, did, we couldn't imagine the kind of world that we live today, just surrounded by smartphones and everything that they have enabled. So I'm, I would love to think that in 10 years, things will be crazy awesome in a way that I cannot even imagine right now. Like, I don't even have the tools right. to think about how cool it can be because someone will come up with something amazing and then that I can, I don't even have the language to describe yet and it, it can be awesome. Because we are constantly surprised by technology. So it's, it's hard. I, we shouldn't presume that we know because someone will come around and... Pfft. At the yep. very least, we'll have a comfortable VR headset. There you go. Yes. Yes. So, so here <laughs> we are. I love that. Ten years from now, Hitman 10 is released. <laughs> and it's a mixed reality game. You put on your glasses and it uses... 5G and spatial anchors out in the world and Niantech is, is helping develop it with some of their technology and you go out into the world. You go out into and a city. And you're the one who falls down the stairs when you put someone else puts the oil <laughs> on go, it. Like a, a banana peel. <laughs> yes. But it, it involves the real world and you, you know, you, you do your adventures and your, you, you make some hits. Out yeah, there like a mixed reality, augmented it. reality. Yeah. I mean, Boy, that would be we keep talking about glasses, right? Uh, skip the glasses. It could be like directly yeah. going into your optical nerve, neural lace. Through right. neural yeah. link right. stuff. Right. Yep. It's very interesting. There we go. All right. I love I love talking about the future. Uh, so I, I'm glad we were able to to get there and wrap it up with that. <laughs> this has been an excellent conversation. If people need to stay connected, get to you, get to IO Interactive. Uh, where should they go? Perfect. Thank you for asking. So IO, our website is IOI.dk. I would probably go to at IO Interactive on Twitter. So we keep talking about things going on in the company, but also about what's going on in our games. And um, I think that's, those are the best ways. We are also on Instagram, etc. But Twitter is a great way to, to get started and IOI.dk to learn a bit more about the company, job opportunities. A bit more and about watch for that 007 
game coming out. I'm kind of yeah. excited about that. So that Good should be really interesting. Well, again, thank you so much. This has been really, really interesting. It was a whole dimension of game creating that I really wanted to get into and Seema and I have talked about. So we really appreciate you taking the time and, and coming on. And we hope to, we'll have to, we'll have to catch back up and see if our predictions come true. Uh, before long. Years. so we'll, awesome. we'll catch back up <laughs> right. in six months and a year and 10 years and see where we're at Ooh, right. thank you Jeff and Sima of course Take care. a lovely, lovely conversation this has been a New Overlords production for more please visit newoverlords.com for video subscribe and feed links and other ways to help the show